willingness to do that. Um, but the rest of us will be um, singing in our heads uh, and enjoying the wonderful words of the songs uh, this morning. But no singing here. But of course, at home, uh, feel free to sing out loud and uh, enjoy, enjoy that part of our, our worship uh, this morning. We're really hopeful and praying that these restrictions will be limited to just this weekend, uh, but they're here for our protection and so it's good that we, that we follow them along. Thanks for, for helping us out with, uh, with that. Unfortunately, we are not going to start up our morning tea uh, this week as we had planned. I'm really sorry um, about that, but our plan is definitely to uh, reintroduce morning teas as soon as these restrictions are, are lifted. Um, and, and so we'll start them up hopefully um, next week, uh, which will coincide with our first wrap, uh, West, Westview Review and Planning Meeting that we uh, have had for well over 12 months. Um, and uh, it just so happens that um, <laughs> it's coincided with a number of items that we need to discuss as a church. So it's, it's good, good timing again uh, by God to allow us to, uh, to do that. Probably uh, two of the main things that we'll need to talk about. Um, uh, we did send out some information this week about um, the building of a car park, which has been on the agenda for many, many years now, uh, but we've reached a point where um, it's now been approved uh, for us to do this. Um, and so we need to talk about what that will look like and uh, going ahead with, uh, with that. Uh, so there's some information about uh, plans for that which we'll try and email out to everybody but people who are here in the hall today uh, there is a plan on the table there to have a look at where we're proposing uh, these seven parking spaces will be just so you know they'll be along this wall on the outside here so just just so you're aware of that and also something to consider moving forward in in now um, the administration of our church the current administrator it happens to be me um, will not be standing to become administrator for the next two years because uh, when JJ comes off sabbatical about 12 months after him I'll be going on sabbatical and so I don't want to be the administrator of the church uh, when I go on to sabbatical. So we're looking for someone to take over the role of administrator or church secretary um, and uh, it's a really easy job, there's very little to it. Um, <laughs> Um, I, can, I can tell you <laughs> everything you need to know, um, but it's something to pray and consider. Um, not that we're going to make that decision at the wrap, but it's just something to, to be thinking about, okay? Um, more important than administration is, is praying. Um, Greater West for Christ have uh, asked us to join a number of local churches in Western Sydney uh, in, a, in a cooperative effort to pray and fast um, in the 10 days leading up to Pentecost. So starting this Thursday for 10 days, uh, they're asking us to join with local churches in praying for our community, praying for our city. Uh, each day we're asking people to set aside five, maybe 10 minutes uh, when we can pray together. Now, we've selected a time, 6.45 in the morning. If that suits you, fantastic. Um, if it doesn't, then if you pray at any time, you'll be joining with the rest of us in, in that. There is a flyer which Gina has wonderfully put together um, telling you a bit about that. And then on the back uh, are the things that we're going to pray for on those 10 days. Uh, so uh, items around our community, um, our hospitals, local police, transport, councils, schools, businesses, prisons, charities, aid agencies, our, our government... And finally, on the 22nd of May, praying for local churches and, and the body of Christ. Keeping in mind that there are lots of people in our church involved with some of these things. Nicole uh, works in one of the local hospitals at, at uh, Blacktown and Mount Druitt. Um, Cornell uh, works on Sydney trains. Um, and, of course, our scripture teacher, um, um, no, Connie, uh, who works here at Crawford at Doonside. So, you know, we have great connections with many of these things, but... Um, these sheets are available on here uh, and we're going to get them sent out on the email um, as well. GPS groups um, are still up and running because they run by Zoom uh, and uh, if you're involved, great. Um, and just a reminder, Thursday night's group will be back this week. Love to see you back there. 
If you're not involved with a GPS group, um, it's our way of connecting in with each other each week around God's word, praying for each other and just encouraging each other in our, in our faith. Um, and we would love for as many people to be involved in this as possible. Speak to me or speak to Gareth. He runs the Wednesday night one at the moment um, and, and we'll find a way to, to help you in there. They're both Zoom meetings right now. Um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's the way that we, um, we connect in. Just to keep also in mind, uh, Bill Harvey will be having some tests this week uh, just to uh, get something checked out. Uh, he'd value your prayers uh, as in the lead up to, uh, to this. Uh, and also a reminder to uh, those at home, uh, we will be sharing communion this morning as we do every week. Uh, you might like to prepare and get something to uh, have for communion uh, towards the end of our, our time together. Wow. That's a few things to remind us of at the beginning and it's good to get those things out of the way so that now yeah, we can focus on the real reason why we're here. We want to collectively worship our God. We want to hear from him uh, and one of the ways we do that here at Westview is uh, each week uh, we read a psalm and this morning I'm reading Psalm 52 uh, and it has a heading, The Steadfast Love of God Endures no matter what we could have added there. Um, yeah, it's to the choir master. Um, it's a psalm of David. It says, When Doeg, the Edomite, came and told Saul, David has come to the house of ha Ahimelech. Um, I'm sure that was very significant in those days. Uh, but this is Psalm 52. Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all the day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because you have done it. I will wait for your name, for it is good in the presence of the godly. Let me pray. Oh, Father, my prayer is that each of us here wants to be uh, that green olive tree, uh, safe in your house, secure in the steadfastness of your love and your mercy. I pray that each one here can testify to your goodness, to your faithfulness uh, and to your grace in their life. And I pray this morning, Father God, as we meet around your word, uh, that you would be pleased to bless each of us, whether we're here in this hall or whether we're meeting online or, or watching this later on in the week. Uh, I pray that, um, yeah, the fact that your people want to come together uh, just brings you joy and, and pleases your heart. Thank you, Father God, for each one uh, who has worked hard to make our time together this morning so special, so significant uh, and such a blessing. Uh, and so I pray you would bless each of us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks to Becky who is going to uh, sing to us. Uh, we'll be able to follow those words along. Um, and then uh, to Tony who is praying and will read our Bible reading. Thanks, guys. Well, I'll invite you, if you would like, to stand. You are most welcome to stand. And I thought we would start with this beautiful old hymn by Fanny Crosby. I read it. It was written in 1873. And what a blessed assurance we have. And so, as we worship this morning in spirit and in truth, let's celebrate in our hearts and minds the living hope that we have through Jesus. Um, and just 1 Peter 1 3 it says praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who is giving us um, 
new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. And this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Praising my Savior all the day long. And this is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. For this is our story and this is our song. We're praising our Savior all the day long. Thank you for praising in your hearts. Have a seat. Good morning. Let's pray together. We come to you, Almighty Gods. God, <coughs> excuse me. We come to you, Almighty God with heads bowed and hearts contrite. You are the giver of all we have, the maker of heaven and earth, the great God whose name is Yahweh and whom we are privileged to call Father. Dear Father, on this Mother's Day, you are aware of every minute detail of our lives. You know every single person who is without a mother, either by choice or some other misfortune. So we pray that you will bring comfort to each one who may have heard, may have had a mother and lost her and the ones who have never had someone to call mother. We thank you for all mothers and how important they are or have been in our lives. The past year more of life has been marked with so much anxiety, fear, even death. So much has happened in our country and across the globe Everyone has been affected, including our mothers. Some have been able, unable to see their children or grandchildren. The isolation has been unreal. We pray that you will bring comfort to mothers. We pray that you will restore them 
in relationships that have been strained or lost. Help them to keep safe from COVID as they seek to re-establish these relationships. Dearest and most merciful Father, we remember before you all poor and neglected persons whom it would be easy for us to forget. The homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Help us to heal those who are broken in body or spirit, and to turn their sorrow into joy. Grant this, Father, for the love of your Son, who for, yours, for, for our sake became poor. And our God and Father of all humanity, turn, we pray, the hearts of all peoples and their rulers, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, peace may be established among the nations on the foundation of justice, righteousness and truth. Through him who was lifted up on the cross to draw all people to himself. Father, as we join with other churches to fast and pray, in the ten days leading to Pentecost, we ask for an awakening of your Holy Spirit to enliven us as we bring to you people and organisations in our area. We pray for your power and strength for them as they serve our community. By your grace we are forgiven. In your peace our lives are lived. By your touch we know healing. In your strength we are made whole. When this is forgotten, our focus on self, your face obscured, forgive us and restore. Take our mustard seed of faith and let it grow, take root and blossom in our hearts and lives. God of grace, forgive our ingratitude for the blessings we have received. Help us to live the lives we proclaim. God of peace, forgive our impatience with the actions of our neighbours. Help us live the lives we proclaim. God of love, forgive our intolerance towards those of other faiths or none. Help us to live the lives we proclaim. God of mercy, forgive our reluctance to offer a word of forgiveness. Help us to live the lives we proclaim. God of hope, accept our repentance as a sweet-smelling offering along, the service, along with the service of our lives. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. A reading this morning is from Jonah, chapter 2, verse 10, and Jonah 3, 1, to the end of the chapter. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was a, an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, neither, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be, recovered, be covered in sackcloth. And let them call out mighty to God, mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented 
of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. Just a quick unscheduled announcement. Our kids are just about to head out to Sunday school. I just wanted to um, say that there's uh, a great opportunity for service here in, in serving our kids here at Westview. If you're somebody who loves to work with kids and loves kids, um, then uh, we're, uh, we've got a great opportunity to um, be part of our Sunday school team. Um, so please come and have a chat to Becky or to myself if you'd be interested in uh, helping out in our Sunday school in a variety of ways. So we're, we're, we're just heading out to Sunday school now. Um, just to uh, let you know what we do with Sunday school, um, uh, at the moment we require a parent to come with a, a child um, just uh, to um, help us to keep a bit of um, supervision for all the kids and um, uh, hopefully down the track we'll be having um, enough people to um, uh, run Sunday school without that requirement but um, at the moment that's what we require so if you've got a, a child coming to Sunday school please join with one of the parents please join the child at Sunday school. All right, we're heading out to Sunday school. Let me pray before we begin. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we think of these things, open our hearts and our minds to hear you. Tell us what you want us to hear and help me to get out of your way. Amen. So let me open this week by asking the question, what is a prophet? I'm informed by the dictionary that the first two entries are, one, a person who speaks for God or a deity or by divine inspiration, and two, a person chosen to speak for God and to guide his people. Okay, that's fine. But right from the beginning of Jonah, we see there's something not quite right about our key character. Right from the start, we see something is wrong. Prophets are meant to be the servants of God. The history in Deuteronomy refers to my servants, the prophets. And in 2 Kings 14.25, Jonah is specifically mentioned as his servant, Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet. We frequently find prophets raising objections to the calling that they've been given. For instance, Moses says, I cannot speak. I am too young. But jo Jonah does more than object. He hears the imperative to rise, and then he rises, but he runs in the other direction. So what we know is that prophets are God's spokespeople. It's what they do. They speak. But Jonah does precious little speaking. In fact, there are only five words in Hebrew of prophecy which he does speak. In English, they translate to, 40 days, the Nineveh overturned. Now, at this point, I had planned to just walk out of here. <laughs> because that would have been exactly the same as what I think Jonah's gift of prophecy was. Five words. Throughout the book, the prophet has to be pressed into speaking. When God speaks to him, he says nothing. When the storm begins, he says nothing. When the sailors cry out to their gods... He says nothing. When the captain of the ship tells Jonah he should cry out to his God, again, he says nothing. Then the sailors cast lots to determine on whose account this misfortune has happened. And when the lot falls to Jonah, he's asleep. <laughs> they, demand to tell, they demand of him to tell him who he is and where this misfortune has come. And then Jonah speaks. So he's a reluctant prophet. He's hardly one of those whose words bubble up and pour out with abundance. If you were looking to hear someone giving a great lecture on a subject that interested you, and they only had five words to say, you'd feel cheated. Moreover, wouldn't you want to hear a preacher who was charged with the word of God and had a message of prophecy, and if all you got was five words, wouldn't you question his credibility? Evidently, those five words had, a, had an effect, though, because as we've had read to us this morning, 
it caused a change, in the, a change of heart in the people of Nineveh and a change of action. This was described by one theologian that I've read, Walter Mobley, that this was the most startling effective human com- communication in the whole history of the world. Certainly no other prophet in Israel's history had been so successful. Of course, there's always the real possibility that I am speaking out of turn and that Jonah had far more to say than five words. He could have wandered into the city and repeated them over and over again. He could have even said more than this. We don't know. However, the author of the book of Jonah has very delicately and deliberately only given us those five words. You see, one of the neat things about the Bible is that it uses a whole heap of different styles and genres to tell stories. It uses different styles and genres to tell deep truths. Last week, Gareth briefly touched on the idea that the book of Jonah works like a comedy. There's nothing wrong with using the tools available to crack open what the Bible has for us. It uses historical narrative, it uses poetry, it uses discourse, argument, instruction, wailing, lament, and great sweeping prophecy. And here I think in the book of Jonah that it is using the literary device of farce. Remember, the ultimate author of scripture is God himself. And not only is he capable of using narrative, he's also capable and willing to write the events of history itself to tell deep truths. I think the book of Jonah is technically what's known as a farce because we have pagans who bow down and worship God, merchants of violence who turn around and repent of their ways, and the man of God who I think does a deliberately rubbish job of preaching and prophecy. The book of Jonah is properly a farce because all of the primary antagonists speak and act in opposite ways to what you would expect. In contrast, the protagonist, that is the one who actually drives the story, the one who writes the story, the one who makes things happen, the one who speaks and acts and actually gets stuff done, doesn't change at all. He acts in exactly the way we would expect. Behold, I am the Lord. God, I change not, he says in the book of Malachi. I want you to remember this because later we'll be hanging a paradox on this. So let's begin in chapter 3. Then the word of of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out it against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. God calls us many times back to a place of failure. And this is where I think he makes Jonah start again too. It's a bit like playing snakes and ladders and going back to square one. I wonder how many times God has brought me back to square one, back to a place of failure. And then he says, okay, this is where we start again. I can't go on until I've conquered this area of failure in my life. I can't continue on in the progress of God in my life until God has worked this out. And when he brings me back to it, I'm facing the same issues again but this time with obedience to the Lord. And then we move on. So we move on. Jonah arose, went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. That is, it would take you three days to walk from one side to the other. So for terms of us, it would be about 60 kilometres across. In comparison, the old city of Jerusalem, the one which Jonah would have been familiar with, is only about four kilometers around. It's tiny. It would take you less than an hour to walk around. A city of three days journey is massive in the ancient world. It's probably about as big as Sydney. Nineveh was the biggest city in the world at the time and probably wasn't eclipsed for being the biggest city in the world in more than 500 years. This was the greatest city in the world. But remember, he didn't even want to be there. He paid a fare to get in a boat going in exactly the opposite direction. He was more than aware that the city was evil and wicked because of nothing else God had told him. That's why he was sent there, to preach against the city. So we move on. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. That's remarkable. Jonah, no doubt, was not happy with what he was doing. This is something that is revealed further on in the text. Jonah's anger at God for not destroying Nineveh. He hated these people. He still didn't want God to work in their lives. He was only there because it was preferable 
to dissolving in the gastric juices of the fish. <laughs> Not only was there no hope laid out in his message at all, there's no call to repentance, there's no loving exhortations, just a message of judgment. There's no mention of what the people of Nineveh had done wrong. There's no call for what they should do to correct it. And there's not even a statement of, of who called Jonah to go there at all. Forty days and Nineveh is always going, is going to be overthrown. But the people believed, much to Jonah's chagrin. I ask another question. Should Jonah have been surprised? No. God is always making plans. He's always preparing things. Already we've seen that God has appointed a storm. He's appointed a fish. And now he's appointed the hearts of, of Nineveh. And later on he will go to appoint a vine, a worm, and a wind. Is this inconsistent with what Jonah should have already known? In the grand story of Israel up to this point, God appointed a goat in place of Abraham's son. He appointed a homeland for the people of Israel to live in. He appointed judges and prophets and kings to teach them. So God is always making plans, preparing times, preparing people, preparing the events of history itself. Jonah should have learnt, as in fact we should learn, that to try to kick against those plans is pointless and futile. Doing so will sometimes likely in a personal hell of our own creation. Jonah had to learn this the hard way. We have a God who has already appointed events and circumstances to bring people to himself. Or perhaps Jonah already knew this, and because of his own prejudice, maybe his racism, he didn't want the people to, of Nineveh to be saved. But God did. Okay, let's pretend for a moment that the New Testament doesn't exist, because in Jonah's time, it doesn't. We should be able to work out what he knew from God, looking at that scripture. So in Isaiah 26.2, it reads, open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. Notice something about this. It doesn't say open the gates that the priests, the Levites and the Israelites should, should enter, but the righteous. Or perhaps Psalm 118.20, this is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter it. Again, it's the righteous who enter in God's presence and not necessarily the priests, the Levites, and the Israelites. God makes no distinction about where the people come from. If Jonah took time to pause and remember the lessons from Israel's own history, instead of running away, maybe you would remember that Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Righteousness never depends upon the efforts of the people, because we cannot present any kind of work and effort to overcome what's inside us. It's like a spoonful of arsenic salts in a bottle of lemonade. Doesn't matter what you do to it, it's still going to kill you. You can't get rid of, you can't clean up the bottle by getting, by, by, by washing it. The only way to get rid of it is by throwing it out. You have to start again. You have to throw the whole bottle away and replace it with a new one. Perhaps Jonah should have remembered that great passage in scripture said by someone else in distress and in trouble. I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Hmm, I wonder who that was. <laughs> With the voice of the thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. I have vowed what I will pay. Hmm, salvation belongs to the Lord. That wasn't said by anyone J J Jonah knew, was it? Hmm, let's move on. Verses 5 through 8. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. There's a call to repentance, even to the animals. Don't feed them. And as the cattle are rolling for hunger, let it be a cry, to, a cry to God for mercy. So even the cattle are getting hungry. You can hear them through the streets. Moo, moo. 
Let that be a cry to God for mercy. You can imagine the noise of the general total repentance of the people as they are in sackcloth and crying out to God, repenting and crying out to God for mercy. I find it interesting, though, that, Gina makes, that, that, that Jesus makes two references to Jonah in his ministry. The first was when the scribes and the Pharisees asked to see a sign from him, and he told them that there would be no sign would be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Because just as Jonah was in, the sign, was in the stomach of the sea creature for three days and nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and nights. But let's set that aside for now. The second reference that Jesus makes to Nineveh as he was caught, talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, he said, the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Think about that. The men of Nineveh repeated at this angry prophet who only preached the judgment of God. Here, Jesus, the son of God, had come declaring to the people of the love of God, encouraging people to experience God's love and to, overcome, and, to, and to come to God's love. But yet they didn't repent. So the men of Nineveh will be standing in, of judgment will be standing and they will be pointing a finger at this generation, those who have not repented, those who have not sought God, and they will be con condemning this generation, for they repent repented at the preaching of Jonah. Repent they did, complete, complete with sackcloth, even to the king laying aside his robes and putting on this horrible, itchy sackcloth, putting it on the, putting on the animals, and everyone joining in, in this giant city-wide repentance. But on what basis did they repent? Jonah didn't say repent, and repent or destruction comes. He didn't, repeat, he didn't preach repentance at all. He didn't want them to repent. He became angry when they did repent. Of the only preachers, he must be one of the only preachers in history that was hoping that he wouldn't have a successful mission. But they repented. On the basis of what? Verse 9. Who knows? God may turn and relent from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Who can tell? Maybe if we repent, God will have mercy. We don't know. No promise of mercy. No promise of grace to these people. Only a message of judgment. And yet, on the slimmest of threads, they were willing to hang their hope. Who can tell? A maybe. Let me tell you today, you don't have to hang your hope on a maybe. You don't have to hang your hope on that slim thread. I can tell you today that if you will, will repent, God is gracious, God is merciful, God will forgive. You don't have to hang your hope on a maybe. I can assure you from the word of God today that God will forgive you if you repent and return from your wicked ways and your sinful path. Because he's told us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God will be right, gracious and merciful, and you'll be washed and cleansed of your sin and made a child of God. I can declare that to you on the basis of God's unchanging word. But these people didn't have that kind of hope. They didn't even have that kind of message. All they had was a maybe. Who knows? Maybe. And even on that, they hung their hope and, um, on a maybe turned and repented so we move on to verse 10 when God saw what they did how they turned from their evil way God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them and he did not do it so here I have a conundrum God, appeared, God appears to have changed his mind and that doesn't exactly square what we know about him I've been asked to give a sermon on Jonah chapter 3 which means that I've been given the internal problem of describing the action of God and unfortunately I don't really have the terms to be able to do it. God is the e infinite eternal God and we are small and futile and so as I try to use terms in dealing with the finite I can't really describe an infinite God. There are things I, do I don't understand and which I can't speak. There's not words and languages which I can even use to relate these things to you. This has not been a problem which has not gone unnoticed. Jesus was talking to Nicodemus 
and he experienced the same thing. And he finally gave up and said, look, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the Jews, and if I speak to you of earthly things and you cannot understand them, how in the world can I speak to you of heavenly things? Paul the Apostle, after his trip to heaven, said, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but I was caught up to the third heaven and I heard things that are impossible to describe. In fact, it'd be a crime if I were to try to describe them. It would be an injustice, because there aren't any words that can describe these things. Words have not been created or formed. So here we have a problem. Because we are limited in talking about God and are forced to use finite technology, so fi finite terminology, when it comes to explaining why judgment did not come, the promised judgment, we have to use terms that are also finite. I think this is a category error. It doesn't work. We have to use terms which aren't applicable to God because God doesn't change. Even the Bible itself has problems trying to contain the infiniteness of God. We remember this in Numbers. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of a man that he, has changed, that he should change his mind. Has he said and he will not do it or has he spoken and he, will he not fulfill it? Or in Malachi, I, behold, I am the Lord God. I do not change, he has declared. But here there's an obvious change. The prophet said 40 days and there comes destruction. The people repented. Destruction did not come. So we're using finite terms to say, well, they, it repented. Or God changed his mind and he, came to destroy, and he came to destroy them. No. It looks like God knew all the time that they were going to repent. That's why he sent Jonah to them. God knew all the time that the judgment wouldn't come. But yet, had they not repented, then judgment would have come. God knows the end from the beginning. And you say, oh, well, I can't understand it. Well, of course we can't. My ways are higher than your ways, says God. And so it's an exercise of frustration to try to understand the full, full aspects and character of the infinite God. Yet I find that liberating. It says to me that the infinite, unchanging God remains infinite and unchanging. He remains reliable. He remains caring. He remains faithful. He remains merciful. So what can we learn about this? From, what can we learn from the, from the tale of Jonah? It's important that God doesn't waste people's efforts and he doesn't waste people. If we can take any way, anything from Jonah's, quite frankly, rubbish ministry efforts, it's that God still used the bare minimum in order to create a work of salvation. Now, I would suggest it's probably not a good idea to use the bare minimum, but at least we can take heart that God will use what we think are small and weak efforts to work something which is often bigger than them. In fact, something that bigger than we can even imagine. I mean, it probably also goes without saying that we can do better than Jonah's five words. God takes our efforts, however weak and small we might think they are, and multiplies them by orders of magnitude. I mean, often God doesn't require a lot of effort on our part, but he does ask for our obedience. And that does require at least some effort. Okay, let's assume for a second that Jonah's refusal and reluctance to, to go to Nineveh was 100% justified. We we're already told that they are known for their violence and their evil. What does that change? Well, not a lot. Because it doesn't change the fact that the people of Nineveh still needed to hear their message of salvation and that God still valued them. Also, despite Jonah's refusal to go, that still didn't invalidate him to be called to go. That, this is interesting for us, because you might feel that you are unworthy or unqualified for serving God because of past mistakes, or maybe even actions that you regret. But God doesn't care. God's love is not dependent on us. He loves us anyway, despite our own sin and stupidity. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. God's message to both the people of Nineveh and to Jonah himself, and indeed us, is that neither salvation nor serving God is an earned position. If God demanded that we worked for our salvation, or even, or even, were, or even demanded that our salvation was necessary in order to serve him, then nobody would stand. There's nobody who's of themselves who is righteous. If we can take anything away from the people of Nineveh, it's that they believed what Jonah had to say about God and then acted upon what they'd heard. 
this says to us that despite their wickedness, God never gave up on them. Again, God's love is not dependent on us. He loves us anyway. He wants what is best for us. He wants, for, he wants what is best for people who we don't like. We might be surprised at the kinds of people who we think are beyond help. We need to get over our own prejudices about who we think needs God's help. If we simply proclaim what we know about God, we might be surprised about who is going to listen. God doesn't give up on people. Neither should we. And I think ultimately the book of Jonah is not about Jonah. I don't think it's about Nineveh either. I think that Jonah is ultimately a a historical narrative about the only one in the story who acts in ways which you should absolutely expect. The book of Jonah, most importantly, is about the character of God. God always wanted what was best for the people of Nineveh. He always wanted what was best for the people on the boat in chapter 1. And he always wanted what was best for Jonah. If we remember that God does not change, then we should also remember that this still holds true. God still wants what is best for us, and we will be equally as foolish to kick against those plans. If we can take anything away from the book of Jonah, and especially from chapter 3, is that the only one who is in the whole book who is consistent and continued to be un- unchanging and consistent was God himself. And I see no reason why that should not still hold true today. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you that you never gave up on the people of Nineveh. We thank you that you cared enough to send someone to speak to them and that you saved them from the destruction which they would have suffered. We thank you that nobody, however wicked, is beyond the pale and that you are always hoping to save. We ask that we would be willing to see people as as you do, in need of a saviour. We thank you for the lesson of Jonah. We thank you that you take our efforts, however feeble, and are able to magnify them. We thank you for what you we thank you that what we have done doesn't disqualify us from being useful. Finally, we thank you for being the eternal unchanging God who always hopes, who is always working, and who always wants what is best for his people. In all of this, we say thank you and amen. So now we come to the part of the service which we as a church like to do every week because it again reminds us of the ridiculous and extravagant lengths to which our eternal and unchanging God is prepared to go. Let me go over again why exactly, what exactly goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it's important. What everyone has to realise is that every time you eat the bread and drink the cup, you reenact with your words and actions, the death of our master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until he returns. But you must never let familiarity breed contempt. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians reminded that anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master irrelevantly is like part of the crowd who jeered and spit on him as he, at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? We are asked to examine our hearts examine our motives and to, he- and, to test our, and, and to test our heart and then come to this meal in awe. So I'm going to leave a few moments for us to remember, to consider and be thankful for what Christ has done. We thank you, Holy Lord, our Almighty Father, the eternal unchanging God, who not through any of our merit, but through out of the extravagance of your goodness, chose to buy and redeem us, all of us, sinners and rebels, who are of no use to you, with the precious body and the blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that this communion is not a a condemnation to punishment for us, but a saving plea to forgiveness. We remember that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And so we say thank you. Our master, Jesus, the one who never gave up on us, even though we were his enemy, on the night of his betrayal, took bread 
and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as we take the bread, break it a little, remember and be thankful. And after the supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. So let's drink together and be thankful. And once again, proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes back to take us home again. Let's drink together and be thankful. And I think it's rather fitting that we close today's service with another song that reminds us exactly of our eternal, unchanging God. When you're ready, I'll invite you to stand again. Sing Everlasting God, and I'd invite you to join with clapping if you'd like to. Yes. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign forever, our hope. A strong deliverer, you are the everlasting God, the everlasting God, you do not faint, you won't grow. As you wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever, our hope, our strong
Can I leave you with after this? The king of Nineveh said, Who knows? God may, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. We don't have to hang our hope on a maybe. We hang our hope on the eternal, unchanging, gracious, merciful, forgiving, everlasting God. I ask that we repay, pray and remember that this week. And thank you.